It's so amazing when we understand that our words matter and everything that we do, do matters. And so that's why we're talking about the power of one. I want you to repeat after me. Say the power as one. Amen. Amen. We will be reading from uh, Second Peter. We'll be reading from Ephesians and we'll be reading from Matthew. And um, I just have a, a word that God has placed upon my heart this morning. And I'm I'm excited to tell you about it in um it, you know, like my wife and everybody else was saying this morning, it's not about anybody else but God. Our lives are about God. And so prior to Jesus uh, coming to this earth, um, God's plan was a mystery. Nobody knew what God's plan was. We had ideas. We didn't know when the Messiah was coming. They, they had the original uh, text. They had the original scripture but nobody knew what was when the Messiah was coming to this earth. Nobody knew our purpose. So everybody chalked it up as unknown. It's like, I know the Messiah is coming because God gave us this scripture. That's what the Jews were thinking. And they were, they were like, we got this, but we don't know what the Messiah's name is. And we don't know when he'll be here. And so the creator had given them the scripture, but he didn't give them all the details to the scripture. And so they were they, they had in their mind different thoughts of of how it would happen. And that created, you know, different pathways that were not righteous, that were not the ways of God. And they didn't understand specifically what God's plan was. And so now Jesus comes down in the flesh. You got God coming from heaven down to earth and in dwelling in a in a body. And so now Jesus comes down into the flesh. He fulfills the purpose of the Father in heaven. And one, he gives us answers to this life. We know the answers. We have the answer. The Messiah has come. We already know. And second, we know the purpose of God's plan. And we know what God wants and what he desires and what he and likes. And it's all written down in the Bible that if we're not careful, we ignore. And so, you know, I like to, you know, you know, I'd like for us to understand that all of us, all of us, every single one of us have sin in our lives. All of us have fallen short. All of us have made mistakes. How many people have told a lie before? How many people have stolen something before? Theo, make, take note of the thieves. <laughs> Me as one also. <laughs> you, you got us all, Theo? All right, all right. Now hold your hand up too. All right, there we go. <laughs> So every one of us has sinned before. If we got before a righteous God, we would be innocent or guilty. Everybody, guilty. guilty. Heaven or hell without Jesus. Hell. Yeah, exactly. Hell. I'm with you. I'm with you. Without Jesus, that's where we would be. And so we have to understand that, that all of us are, have failed without God. And so when we try to figure out, well, why did he come down to earth? Well, that's why, to help us. And so, you know, I, I want us to know that so that we get off our high horses and stop thinking that, that the things we do are not bad and that we're righteous and we can get before God and explain ourselves. We can't do that because all of us have failed. All of us have fallen short. All of us have sinned. And so, we, you know, I'm excited because the baseball playoffs are happening right now. How many people, woo, woo, baseball playoffs? Anybody know about that? The Houston Astros and the Texas Rangers, all right? Everybody say Hallelujah. All right, yeah. Two Texas teams. So one of them going to be in the World Series. I can, I can flip and just choose one. If, if they win, fine. If they lose, fine. Because <laughs> Texas has made it. Can you give God honor and glory to the Lord this morning? Amen. So I'm excited about that because I talk about that because um, when, we, when we understand these playoff teams, we understand that anyone is capable of going to the World Series. 
any one of them. You don't have to know about baseball, but you have to know that if you make the playoffs, you could potentially go to the World Series. And so any of these teams are capable of going there. And all of the teams are capable of hitting home runs. There are no teams that have not hit a home run all year. They hit home runs. They, they knock the ball over the fence. They are successful. But wouldn't you agree that all the home runs they hit in practice don't matter if you cannot uh, bring that into the game? It doesn't matter how many times you hit it over the fence in practice. No matter how, many, how much you show your strength, it doesn't matter until you get into the game. And so if you can't duplicate that during the game, it's useless. And so there were a lot of teams going home because they could not duplicate that success. So when we think about that, when we think about that in comparison to Christianity, uh, we have all been made successful in Christ. We have successfully made it to the playoffs by way of the Holy Spirit. And so we're batting against an enemy who does not like us, but we still showed up this morning. Can you give God honor and glory in the house of the Lord? And so when you understand that he does not like you, he does not want you to be successful, but you have to understand the God, the Lord we serve guarantees us access to the world series. He guarantees us access with a chance to win it all. But here's the difference. The difference is we're on the same team and not only only are we on the same team, we're all guaranteed to win the World Series when it comes to God. We are guaranteed eternal life. We are guaranteed life with God just because we believe that Jesus died for us, even though all of us have sinned. When you understand that, you want to show up for the game. You want to show up. Not because you're worried about whether you're going to win, but because you've already won through Jesus Christ. So the devil who is on the other team can't stop you once you believe in Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior. Now, I didn't say you wouldn't have problems because some of you came in here with problems. I didn't say I, not one time did I say you wouldn't have challenges. Not one time did I say you wouldn't have trials, but I did tell you that you're on the winning team. And no matter how many times he tries to pitch at you, no matter how many times he tries to strike you out, no matter how many times he tries to bring you down, God is greater than the one who is against you. And you have the spirit of God within you. And when you understand that, how many people have fallen down before? Yeah, before Jesus. How many times have done that? Done that. You've done that several times. How many times have you gotten back up? Who do you think is assisting you as you get back up? That is the Holy Spirit of God it's telling you to get back up. Even though your trials seem, uh, seem so overpowering, seem like they can break you down, seem like they can destroy you, no weapon formed against you shall prosper. And so when you understand that, that the devil cannot stop you, I want you to repeat after me. Say, the devil cannot stop me believe that just like you believed in the limit and so he tries to stop you but he knows that he can't he tries to prolong a victory that's already happened and so he wants you to think something else other than you having the victory and so as a Christian, you have answers and guarantees to everything you need in life. Now, here's the problem. We come in here with our problems. He's like, where, where are the answers? Well, I, I just want you to know that there are answers to every circumstance, every situation, every trial and thought process. There are answers to every one of them in this word of God. And so as a Christian, you have the answers and the guarantees to everything you need in life to hit home runs in everything you do. <laughs> Did you not hear me? You have success. You have success in every. I know some of you may have come in here and say, I don't even have a place to stay. But you have the Lord God Almighty. You are a part of the World Series and you win the World Series according to what God says. 
Some of you say, I don't have money in the bank. Well, you don't have to have money in the bank. You have the, the father who has cattle on a thousand hills. You have the one who was and is and is to come. You have the one who is greater than all kings, greater than all lords. He is the mighty one. He is in your camp and you win. I don't have food, but you ate enough to come here. So you do have something. God is providing for you. And he's got more for you. And I need you to understand this, that you are more than a conqueror through Christ Jesus. You have to understand that the righteousness flows in you. And so as a Christian. You have answers and guarantees for everything you have in life. To be excited, to hit home runs. You come here to learn how to hit another home run. That's all I'm here to tell you. You can hit a home run in every circumstance, every situation. But you're coming here to, to learn how to hit another home run by following the proven success system that's called Jesus Christ. When, when we don't follow Jesus, we foul out sometimes. We strike out sometimes. We make bad decisions. Anybody in here made bad decisions before with a show of hands? Some of y'all raised two hands. Some of y'all raised some feet up. <laughs> Look, I see the brother got his foot up in there. He's like, I, if I can raise my butt up, I'm going to do it. <laughs> because we all make mistakes. But you're still on the winning team. How many people understand that in the World Series, if it's the Astros or the Rangers, whichever one is in the World Ser Series, when they win, if you did not play a day on that, in that game, if you sat on the bench all the time, you'd get a ring. Why? Because you're on the team. Bat boys get a ring. Coaches get a ring. People who may not even be at the game will get a ring. Why? Because they're part of the team. And what I'm saying is you are part of the World Series and God guarantees you you will be successful. And if you're going to be successful, just being part of God's team, you have eternal life. And so you come here to learn how to hit another home run by following God's proven system called Jesus Christ. Now, let me clear, clarify. Uh, he didn't say you wouldn't have problems. He didn't say you wouldn't have challenges. But he did say he'd be with you. I want you to look up here and confess. I want you to say this. Say, I have everything I need within the power of God to live a godly life. Look, you need to understand that that power that we're talking about that supports that statement that we just said is the power of God. It is the power that has you breathing right now, that has your heart still beating right now. It is the power that has enabled you to see right now. It is the power that has enabled you to walk right now. It is the, the power that has enabled you to get up this morning. It is the strength that you need in life. That power supports the statement that we have everything within us. And once we understand that that power that we have is the power as one, we've got the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit who activate, who operate as one. Once we understand that, we can achieve anything God has called us to achieve. The problem is sometimes we know, we know what we've done in our life instead, and we're judging our life with Christ based on our life on this earth. And they're not the same. And so when you're one with God, everything works. Let me give you an example. The, the Bible says that the two, when we get married, the two become what? One. If the two are two, it doesn't work. If the two are one, it works. Why? Because they are operating not on their will, not on the other person's will, but on the will of God. The will of God says forgive when you don't want to. The will of God says show love when you don't when the person doesn't deserve it. The will of God says repent. So one with your spouse, your marriage will work. And here's the problem. Sometimes we think, well, it's just not working. Well, it's not working because you're not working. You're not. We're working according to your will instead of according to God's will. When we work according to God's will, it always works 100 percent of the time. Do you understand that? There is no marriage that does not work without God perfectly in line. 
every marriage with God in line, first in everything, will work. Because it's not based on me, it's based on God. So we understand that. One with your Lord, with the Lord's purpose at our jobs, that works. Didn't say you wouldn't lose your job. Didn't say you wouldn't have problems on your job. But I said one with our Lord's purpose at our jobs work because you're no longer at your job for your glory. You're at your job for God's glory. You're here to share the gospel. You're here to talk to somebody he wants you to talk to about. You're here to be an example of God. One with God's plan for our church works. When we do that, our ministry works. We come together on one accord as a church, things happen. Guess what? We come together and we go out and we feed people who are homeless or people who may not have as much as we have. When we go out as one, guess what happens? People get fed. We agree to have a free car wash. Guess what? Everybody comes together. When we do that, guess what? Cars are washed. Why? Because we're operating as one. We agree to give out clothes for free. And when we give out clothes for free, guess what happened? We all come together and people get clothes. We all work together on this building. This building just didn't pop up looking like it looks. It looks like it because one person came together and got other people together and everybody came together. And guess what happened? This happened. And so second Peter uh, verse one, I mean, second Peter one, verse three through four gives us confirmation of this. This is what it says. His divine power has given us everything we need for a godly life. We can say that goodbye. We're done. His divine power has given us everything we need for a godly life. And then it goes further to say, through our knowledge of him who has called us by his own glory and goodness. Verse four says this, through these, he has given us his very, his very great and precious promises so that through them, you may participate in the divine nature, having escaped the corruption in the world caused by evil desires. Look, God doesn't need to, uh, God doesn't need to make us perfect. He doesn't need to make us perfect. He just needs us to understand that we've been made perfect through him. <laughs> Do y'all get that? You're not perfect alone. You're perfect in Christ. When you understand that you're not perfect alone, then you operate in the perfection of Christ. What does God have to say about my circumstance? How does God want us to get together as a church? How does God want me to act in my relationship? How does God want me to act at my job? When you understand that, you'll stop operating alone and operate in Christ. And so we're not going to find it anywhere else through the love of God, but through the love of God. When we understand that we've been made perfect through Christ, we stop looking for love elsewhere, except by the power of God. Love in Christ is agape love. Love in the world is a factuation. You can't live without him. You can't live without her. I'll never let you go by yourself. You ever heard those before? Any of you ever said it before? That's what we do when we operate separate from the love of God. And what was that? Uh, was that old country song? Yeah, family, I listen to country too. Just want y'all to know that. Yeah, y'all thought I didn't. I listen to everything. I listen to Hano. Uh huh. Stop it. Don't judge me. I see y'all. I listen to everything. I listen to blues. Yeah, I don't got Ram Herrera. I met Ram Herrera. I real Cindy, can you tell her that I met Ram Herrera? I went to his house. His sister's name is Dora Gray. Oh yeah, that's right. I know. Y'all better stop. Uh huh. Uh huh. Uh huh. You yeah, mess up. Jay Perez. Bobby Polito. Stop it! Don't get me started today. Roberto Polito. I know them all. Stop it. <laughs> Don't mess with
with me today. I, I got my stuff up. Uh, you, look, you started. Uh, I got the mic. Uh huh. Who, who else you want? Who else you want? Jay Perez is who with the voice, right? Stop it. Better not mess with me today. <laughs> I get you in a bit, Bob. I get you in. <laughs> okay, play with me. I know all this stuff. I just don't speak like LJ speaks. <laughs> So I, I say that because, you know, we just have fun at this, you know, uh, when we operate outside of the love of God, we, we were looking for the country song, looking for love in all the wrong places. Y'all remember that? And how many people know that? We got even young people know that song too? Looking for love in all the wrong places, looking for love in too many faces. Look, y'all know it. Y'all ain't been Christians all y'all lives. Look at y'all. <laughs> Some of y'all singing it. What? Y'all, I hear y'all know y'all singing it. But <laughs> look at your neighbor and say, don't judge me. <laughs> Amen. So that's what Christians do when we look everywhere else but God. And um, we find love, but not agape love. We find forgiveness, but not eternal forgiveness. We find a fix, but not life changing restoration. You get it? So when we do things improperly, we get all the, 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 the great accolades of life, but we don't get Christ. And so God has given us, this Bible says God has given us everything we need to be successful. We just have to take advantage of it. We have to stop looking for love elsewhere. We have to look for love in God. And so, and so if we get into a relationship, we have to judge the relationship according to what God says, not according to how we feel. And so uh, before Jesus came to this earth, they were confused. They didn't have an answer to when the Messiah was coming. They didn't know when and they had hope, but not uh, total assurance of the will of God. And so now that we understand that the will of God, what the will of God is to bless us, that he wants to have eternal life with us. We can now move in a different direction. And now we understand, we understand the will of God is to unite everything back to Jesus. Every single form of foundation, the beginning and the end, the, from Genesis to uh, uh, Exodus, to Leviticus, all the way to Revelation, it's referencing Jesus. And when you understand that, then you want to focus your lives around Jesus. And now we understand the will of God and we want to unite with Christ. Uh, can you, you can we have trust as a winning team to to do what God has called us to do? Of course we can. And we can hit home runs in everything we do. If we just follow what God says about it, we make it tough. The only reason we wasn't here when we were babies, because our parents wasn't here when we were babies. The only reason. And so in the cycle continues as we continue to follow everything else but God. But now we're on the right team and we understand that we can trust God and we understand we can trust his way and we understand that we can hit home runs in everything we do. And we need to take this word literally and apply it to our lives. What you learn today, you take home and you read for yourself and you make sure it's understandable that you know what it's about and you apply it to your lives. And once you do that, you start receiving success, you know, the successful feeling of the Holy Spirit. How many of you, when you came here and you start coming here more, you start to learn more and you start to apply more and you get that different feeling in your spirit? How many people have had that? If you've had that, show God a round of applause this morning in the house of the Lord. I need you to understand one thing about that. That is not me. That is God. It is the word of God being active in your lives. And so we have to find God's will in our situations. And with that comes God's peace. God's will in your marriage brings God's peace. God's will in your finances brings God's peace. God's will in your church brings God's peace. Let's read what the Apostle Paul says about this in Ephesians 1, verse, uh, verse starting at verse 8. With all wisdom and understanding, he made known to us the mystery of his will according to his pleasure, his good pleasure, which he pur purposed in Christ. So God the Father's plan was in God the Son's purpose. That's simple. 
God the Father's plan was in God the Son's purpose. Now, verse 10, it says, to be put into effect when the times reach their fulfillment, to bring unity to all things in heaven and on earth under Christ. So everything is not just about God the Father and God the Holy Spirit. Everything is based on God who? The Son. To bring unity to all things in heaven and on earth under Christ. And so it was the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, but yet they wanted to bring unity in Christ. Listen to these words slowly as I read them here. Verse 11. In him, it's talking about us, we were chosen. How's that feel? Look, look, you think you came here because your friend invited you. You think you, you think you came here because they, but they invited you to other stuff and you never showed up. You came here because the Holy Spirit invited you. And that spirit has purpose for your life and is fulfilling the purpose of the father and the son. Look, it says in him, you were also chosen, having been predestined. Mm. According to the plan of him who works out everything in conformity with the purpose of his will. That means that God predetermined you to have purpose in his perfect plan. Do you understand that? I know you messed up. I know you may have drank a little bit too much sometimes. I know you may have went to the clubs that I went to. Can I get an amen this morning? I'm not going to eyeball any of you who have been there with me. A few of y'all. <laughs> Somebody said, stop it. <laughs> stop telling. Everybody say, don't judge me. And so even though we had ulterior motives in our lives, God still had a plan to show it. Look, if I had went 20 or 30 years ago and said, hey, guess what, guys? Dancing in the club. Hey, guess what? We're going to be in church 20 years later. You'd be like, man, get out of here. But look what happened. Look what the Lord has done. Can you give God honor and glory in his house? I'm acting like some of y'all say, well, we were military. You went to the NCO. Stop it. Stop acting like, because I was there too underage. I just want to let you know that. Yeah, exactly. We didn't even have fake. We just slid in. <laughs> see, me and you need to talk. See, I see I see where you're going now. You, you, you missed some places out of there, right? All right, so. Dang, my mom's here. I keep forgetting. <laughs> Hi, mom. Let's ignore this part. <laughs> So it's, it's amazing because it means that God predetermined you to have purpose in his perfect plan. He did, it wasn't based on you being perfect because none of us are. All of us messed up. All of us done things wrong. So it wasn't based on that. It was based on his glory, his perfection. And so you should honor God by knowing that he chose the insignificant to do the significant things in Christ. But once you understand that, not one of God's children are failures in Christ. And here's the reason why. God's reasoning for us was not because of our works. His reasoning for us because of, was because of his perfect will. That's what the word says here. He wants us so much and he loves us so much that he wants to share his inheritance with those who don't even deserve it. And not only did he want to share it with us, he knew you were going to do what you were going to do, but he predestined you to not fail. Because if he left you according to what you've done, you'd fail. But because of what he's done, you've succeeded. Can you give God honor and glory in his house? Some of you have had challenges. Some of you have had trials. And you judge your relationship with God based on your trials. No, you should judge your relationship based on what he's done. He's chosen you and predestined you to be successful. And so everything that Jesus did while on earth was for the will of the father. If you read, Jesus says, I did the will of, I'm doing the will of him who sent me. This is for my father. And so our predestined inheritance is because of the father's perfect plan for us. It's not based on our decisions, not based on our will, but based on the love of God. 
And if we base everything we do on the love of God, we accomplish as one when we understand we're not insignificant. We are the children of the Lord Most High. We are blessed and highly favored. There is no weapon that can form against us that will prosper. And when we join together as one, we understand that we can do all things through Christ who gives us strength. He is a mighty God. And so he doesn't give us these things because we've earned it. He doesn't give us these things because we deserve it. He doesn't give us these things because we decided to say, I accept Jesus as my Lord and Savior. He gave us these things because he loves us and it's based on his will. Look, back to verse 11 again. I want to read this slowly. In him, we were also chosen, having been predestined according to the plan of him who works out everything in conformity with the purpose of what? His will. In order that we who were the first to put our hope in Christ might be for the praise of his glory. Every time you do something right, every time you do something righteous, it's for the praise of his glory. It's not because of you because you were in the club with me. It's because of him, because of everything he's done. You are here today because of God. You are living today because of God. You are breathing today because of God. You are praising today because of God. And when you understand that, you'll shout hallelujah every single day and stop looking at your insignificantness. Everything in the conformity of with the purpose of his will, everything in order with his purpose, which brings forth his will, which brings forth his works. This is why we do what we do every day. Look as your neighbors say the power as one. I want you to write this down. Where there is vision, there is provision. Where there is vision, there is provision. Look, let me, let me give you an example of how that works. A bunch of us who are in this room right now, we sat outside a few years back, um, and we were just talking about how we would want this church to look. And we were talking about the doors that you see outside, the, the doors that were not there at the time. We were just sitting there as a, as a group talking about what, what we would love to do. And so we had vision of what we wanted to do, but we didn't know how to do it. We didn't have a plan put in place, but we had vision of how we wanted the sanctuary to look. We had vision of how we wanted the outside to look. We had vision of the kids' rooms. We had vision, exactly, but we didn't have provision with just us. And so we sat outside and we conversated about the vision for the canopy. We, we, we kind of we conversated about the vision for the doors, but we didn't know how. We conversated about the AC because we only had one at that time and the kids were sweating in the room. And we conversated about all that stuff and how we were going to get it done. And we didn't know. We just said one nail at a time. We'll do it one window at a time. We'll do it one thing at a time. We'll do it one piece of carpet at a time. We'll do it one door at a time. We'll do it one person at a time if we have to. So we, we had vision, but it was God's provision. <laughs> we didn't know how we were going to get it done. Not knowing that Jehovah Jireh was at work as we were speaking. He, we had the vision of those doors, but we didn't know how we were going to cut that frame out. Because if we cut it down, then the whole building going to fall off. We didn't know anything about the doors. We didn't know how to get them here. We didn't know how to pay for them. But in our vision, God had provision. And as we were speaking about that, somebody walked out and heard us talking about that. And that person said, guess what? I'm going to get you those doors. They had nothing to do with the conversation, but they said, I'm going to get you the doors. And guess what? They came here and they put the doors on for free. Stop it. Stop it. That's why I'm saying you have to have vision. You have to speak it out, what you want done, and God will show you with the provision. Look, I want you to understand, three weeks ago, there was not carpet on that floor. Three weeks ago, one week ago, this sign wasn't there. One week, two weeks ago, that painting wasn't there. Do y'all understand that all you have to do is have vision? Once you have vision, you speak it out. You confess it with your mouth and God will provide for you. 
I need you to understand that family. Look, <laughs> stop holding it in. Call those things that are not. Start speaking, start believing, start trusting. I'm not saying that things manifest, but your heart starts to believe it. And so a few, we had vision, but God gave us provision through our obedience. And so this is how the power as one works. It doesn't mean that we're speaking things into existence, but we're confessing what we want, what we desire, who God is in our life. I will be successful because this world will tell you who you are not. This world will tell you you'll never be successful. You'll never have this. You'll never amount to anything. So you've got to start believing what God says you are. Just like you believed in the lemon and your mouth watered, you need to believe what God says over your life so he can provide for you. When we say the words saved by grace, it's not by the grace because of the things you've done. It's not based on all the things you've done wrong. It's based on all the things that God has done right. Do you understand that? All have sinned, all fall short of the glory of God. One man saved all believers for the Father's will. All believers could not save themselves because their will was not powerful enough. Meaning your will doesn't save you and make you righteous before the father. And so when we see, let, let, me, let, me, let me help you here. When we see where the angel visited Jesus or the angel visited Joseph, the father of Jesus, to confirm Mary being pregnant by the, uh, with the son of God. Uh, when we also uh, read about the angel that visited Peter and freed him from prison. Uh, remember that. Or when Jesus visited Paul and uh, was, Paul was blinded. Um, and uh, those are all acts that, that have less to do with the actual people and everything to do with the conforming will of God. They, God wanted them to conform to his will, not their own will. It had none. To, Paul wasn't special. Joseph wasn't special. Mary wasn't special. But only Jesus was special. You get what I'm saying? Paul, Paul was blinded because of Jesus, not because of Paul. And so uh, it's the, the will of God. Uh, is the main purpose in our existence. And so when Jesus met the hill man uh, the, the, and healed the man on the, the, at the pool of Bethesda, when he, he met that man, it had less to do with the invalid. That man was an invalid. It had less to do with his circumstances. It had everything to do with God's purpose in that circumstance. God met him exactly where he was at because God had a purpose for him. And that purpose prevails over anything we do. So when you understand that, that man was healed for the praise of the glory of him in Christ. And so when we are saved, we are saved not because of anything we have done, not because of anything we have said. We are saved by the grace of God. And you have got to understand that you are saved because God wants you to be saved. You are redeemed because God wants you to be redeemed. You have inherited the eternal life because God has given it to you. And once you understand that, do you walk with the grace that God has given you? When Jesus was baptized and to begin his ministry, it says in this, I want you to understand this, Matthew 3, verse 16 and 17. At that moment, heaven was open and when uh, he and he saw the spirit of God descending like a dove and alighting on him and the voice of heaven came uh, said, this is my son whom I love with him. I am well pleased. I need you to hear that. I need you to hear what was just said. He was saying that about who his son. Watch this. Sometimes our emotions, when it comes to the things of Christ, we see our past sins and we see ourselves as not worthy before a righteous God. And without Jesus, none of us are worthy. But it's quite the opposite because the father doesn't see you when he sees you. He doesn't see all the things you've done. He sees his purpose included in Jesus in you. So when he sees you, he doesn't see the imperfection of the things you've done, the imperfection of the way you look, the imperfection of your thoughts. He sees Jesus. You've accepted Jesus. And that has made him sin and made you righteous. And so verse 13, it says, and you, <laughs> verse 13, Ephesians 1, verse 13, and you were included in Christ. Who? You. Everybody say me. 
you, every one of you were included in Christ. What does that mean? It means you were included in Christ. What does that mean? It means you were included in Christ. It says, when you heard the truth, the message of truth, the gospel of your salvation, when you believe you were marked with him with a seal, the promised Holy Spirit, who is a deposit guaranteeing our inheritance until the redemption of those who are God's possession to the praise of his glory. There he goes again. What does that mean? Let's combine it. Let's combine it. I need you to hear this. Please hear this. Please hear this in your heart. I want you all to slowly grasp this. When you believe in Jesus, you were sealed in Jesus, with the same spirit that came down on Jesus when he was baptized by John. Jesus was perfect and he was made sin. Then you were sin and now you are made perfect. <laughs> Do you hear that? <laughs> oh, hallelujah. <laughs> Let me say that again. Jesus was perfect. He was God who came down to the earth. He was perfect. There was no imperfection in him. He came down and he became sin. And in return, you became the righteousness of God. What does that mean? When God sees you, he sees Jesus. He sees perfection. He sees the one who was and is and is to come. He sees the righteousness of God. You are blessed. Say, I am blessed and highly favored. And so when you... The spirit of God, just like it descended on, on, on Jesus, descends on you also. It doesn't descend on you as unrighteous. It descends on you and makes you righteous. You are the righteousness of God. That does not change. And so the spirit of God descends on you by way of the son of God, not because you've done anything or done anything good or anything bad, but because of everything that Jesus did. Jesus became you so that you can become him. What does that mean? You can't go before righteousness unrighteous. It is impossible. You can't go before righteousness as unrighteous. Unless you first be made right. And so stop looking at your past. Stop looking at your history. Stop looking at your addictions. Stop looking at your attractions and stop telling them how small your God is and start telling your God how big he is. I can see the, the, the person in here who has just accepted the Lord and Savior and they came with their imperfection and they're screaming out this morning and, they're, and, and I can see God saying, this is my son whom I love. With him I am well pleased. This is my daughter whom I love. With her I am well pleased. These are my children whom I love. With them I am well pleased. Can you give God honor and glory in his house? You have got to understand who you are. He's not saying you didn't say wrong things. He's not saying you haven't done wrong things. He's not saying you won't think wrong things. He's not saying you haven't had wrong attractions. He's not saying you haven't cursed anybody out before. But he's saying that greater is the one that is in you than the one that is in the world. You have the mind of Christ because he gave it to you. And I need you to get that. You are children of God. And as we work as one, God is glorified. Let me read this prayer real quick in verse 15. For this reason, ever since I heard about your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for God's people, I have not stopped giving thanks to you, remembering you in prayers. I keep asking the Father that God uh, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the glorious Father, may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation. What is that spirit? That spirit that tells you it's not based on you. It's based on Christ. You understand who you are. You are a child of God. So that you may know him better. I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you may know the hope to which he has called you, the riches of glory and inheritance in his holy people and his incomparable 
great power for us who believe. Look, nothing should give you more solid foundation than knowing that God has called you for a purpose and a plan that had nothing to do with you. When you understand that you are not insignificant, you are successful. You are not cursed. You are blessed. When you understand who you are, you're like, oh, wait a minute. I thought I was cursed. I'm blessed. Oh, oh, wait a minute. I thought I had nothing. I have everything. Oh, wait a minute. I think I didn't make the team. I'm on the World Series. When you understand who you are, you'll start walking in the righteousness God has given you. And when we grasp that onto that fact, we'll run through a wall to find Jesus. We'll seek him in every area of our lives. It's not because you're looking for something from him, but because you've already been given something by him, something that you have not even earned. Some of you are coming in here with challenges and trials and tribulations and saying, I wonder why I'm here. Well, you're here because God brought you here and you have favor upon your life and you are blessed and highly favored. And there is no weapon that can form against you that will prosper. And you have the righteousness of God. You are the redeemed of the Lord. Whatever you say is so you are blessed and highly favored. Do you understand that? Stop living in the past and live in the future. Let me read this. That, that power is the same uh, as the mighty strength he exerted when he raised Christ from the dead and and seated him at his right hand in the heaven uh, in the heavenly realms far above uh, all rule and authority, power and dominion and every name that is invoked, not uh, only in the present age, but also in the one to come. And God placed all things under his feet and appointed him to be head over everything in the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills everything in every way. This is our Lord. This is our savior. He promises he'll be here. It says when two of us agree on anything related to him, he is here. So he is right here. The Lord is looking at you. He is pleased with you, not because of what you've done, but because of everything he's done. When you understand that, you'll just praise God. He is our Lord. He is our Savior. He is our God. He is our King. He is our master. There is none higher than him. When you understand that he was made your sin so that you can be made his righteousness, that doesn't change no matter what you've done or what you would do. No matter how many things you do good or how many things you've done bad, you've been made the righteousness because it was a gift of God. And so we've got to start walking in that righteousness. Look at your neighbor and say, I don't know about you. But I'm blessed. And look, look, did you hear that? He said, like, I don't know about you. But I'm blessed. Y'all are real loud after that. <laughs> and so this is a permanent decision. When the father sees you, he sees Jesus. Stop going to him feeling imperfect. Go to him with the righteousness of God. God, forgive me. Thank you. God, forgive me. Restore me. God, forgive me. Renew me. God, forgive me. Help me. Give me division. Give me understand. Provide for me. Protect me. You started acting like you're a child who has an inheritance. Stop acting like you're not part of the crew. You're on the same team. You're in the World Series. You are victorious. You are righteous. You walk in the favor of God. You need to start acting like it. You'll stop condemning yourself for the things you've done wrong and begin praising him for the things he's done right. <laughs> You'll stop dwelling in condemnation and depression and start living in praise and adoration. <laughs> You'll stop wandering in wilderness and start living in righteousness. Family, it's time. Look at your neighbor and say, it's time. No more, no more, no more, no more, no more. Mm -mm. You start realizing who you are and stop living like who you were. You are a child of the most high God. You're not a child of the president. 
You're not a child of a king or a queen. You are a child of the most high God. There is nothing that is greater than that. And so as children of God, you have to act like you have an inheritance. You don't know all the details to it, but you know that God is with you. You know that no weapon formed against you will prosper. You know you have the righteousness of God. You know where you walk is holy ground. You know that you are blessed and you could not be cursed, that there is no evil that can befall you, that can tear you down, that, that can destroy you because you are a child of God. And when you believe that in your heart, you'll walk with it. You'll talk with it. You'll breathe with it. You'll smell like it. Everything will reflect the Lord Jesus Christ. You'll be able to pick somebody up and say, you're better than this. Why? Because what's in you is greater. You'll be able to grab their arm in their worst circumstance. Say, come on, walk with me. Come on, resist the devil. Come on, resist the enemy. Resist the attacks. Come on, I'll be there. I'll talk with you. I'll, sh I'll ship with you. I'll we'll do whatever we got to do together as children of God. You won't be embarrassed. You'll love to talk to all people. It doesn't matter whether they're rich or whether they're poor, whether they're high or whether they're low, whether they're blessed or whether they're cursed. You'll go before them and say, the, I carry the righteousness of God within me. And so the power of God makes you walk in union with the presence of God. The presence of God makes you want to dwell in the peace of God. The peace of God makes you want to walk in the righteousness of God. And that righteousness of God makes you want to stay in the love of God. It places you in constant union with each other. The reason we love each other is because of God. If we hate each other, it's because of the enemy. Do you understand that? It's impossible for a believer to hate another believer unless they operate in the other world. So... I want you to look up here and I want you to believe it. I want you to say the power as one. I am blessed. 